one day you're driving down the street and one of your neighbors out of their window is coming flames. You're going to stop and go, huh? <gasps> Does he know his house is on fire? It's not going to catch us fire. My it wakes you up. It's a trigger. It's a brain trigger that's wired into us. That's what brain glue is, is you want to have, I call it, you want to light the fire of desire in your buyer. Okay. You, because when we look at products, what do we look at? Oh, product, 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 product. Okay. Product, product, product. Okay. Big deal. We tend to not notice it, but you want to light, you want to have flames coming out of your window of your product. Okay. You want to have them go, huh? What's that? Huh? James wanted to say thanks again for, for taking time and being flexible with me to, to sit down and chat, but wanted to just give you first an opportunity. Tell me a little bit about yourself and, and what brain glue is. Sure. Thank you, Jordan. Well, I'm an old guy. I'm originally from Montreal. I live in Southern California now. And uh, I uh, started an advertising agency in Montreal. I worked my way up and won major clients like Kraft, Timex, Avon, uh, Seagram's or world headquarters is there. And, um, um, I remember I worked with my brother for a period of time. I have two brothers. I'm the oldest of four and he was much better at selling than me. And it really pissed me off and he could, you know, he could sell me better than I could sell me. But I think the scientist in me was fascinated by the whole concept of, um, you know, like selling and persuasion and all that stuff. And since I was in advertising, as I've always been in advertising and marketing, I've always been fascinated by this concept. So I uncovered this thing that's mind blowing and it's blowing people's minds. I'm calling it brain glue, but it's existed long before I named it. And it's uh, triggers that make it easier to sell. And it's just amazing. John Gray, I met John Gray. Actually, the first thing that got me was I had an opportunity to win the anti-drug campaign in America. Uh, with powerful logical reasons why you should not do drugs. I'm a logical guy, as I guess most of us are. And I was beat by an ad that was tremendously more powerful than anything I created. And they loved our ad, you know, and the ads that we had, which are logical reasons why you should not do drugs. But then there's a guy holding an egg saying, this is your brain. Cracks the shell and drops the egg into a sizzling frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? It's not logical. It's emotional, it's emotional selling. And it blew my mind because, and scared me because, you know, they don't teach it in school how to do emotional selling. And yet, and from research I've done over the years, I've done this for over 35 years now, the research showed that over 90% of buying decisions are emotionally triggered. In marketing, we think, in business, we think of, you know, you want somebody to know, like, and trust you. I got that. So there's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an emotional connection. But um it's when you're running ads, when you're marketing a product, you know, the name of your product, how you pitch it, if you can make it emotional, you know, if you can add emotional elements to it, suddenly sales will explode. And I realized that. I mean, I, I met, hang on. <clears throat> there we go. Um, I met uh, John Gray many years ago or years after this, after I, I, I was experiencing the, um, you know, uh, this is your brain on drugs ad. And John Gray was telling me how he wrote a book called Men, Women, and Relationships. And it was profound, one of the best relationship books ever. But it only sold a few thousand copies, actually about 20,000 copies. And if you make a buck a book, you can't live on your book, you know. <clears throat> but he got this crazy idea. He was sitting in a, in an, with an audience trying to promote the book. And he said something and everybody in the audience started laughing like crazy. Uh, sorry, all the women in the audience laughed like crazy. And the men looked at the women like, what are you laughing at? And the topic came up of, you know, women laugh at different things than men do. Men laugh at different things than women do. And sometimes we laugh at all the same thing. And so out of that discussion with the audience, the conversation came up and, and one of the women said, well, what are, it's almost like men are from a different planet. <laughs> what planet do you think men are from? And he said, I guess, I don't know, men are from Mars. And everybody laughed. Everybody laughed. And when he got home, he thought, well, if men are from Mars, where are women from? Well, women are from Venus. Venus is a god of love. He changed the title of the book. So get this, okay? He sold 20,000 copies with his men, women, and relationships. But when he changed the title to men are from Mars, women are from Venus, you know, and changed the text a little bit. So it would refer to it. He sold 50 million copies. 
He went from 20,000 to 50 million, all because he changed the title. And I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, this is incredible. Actually, in my book, I say he sold 10 million copies. And I'm friends with uh, the guy who works and promotes and works with him in, in marketing. And he said, no, you're wrong. It's not 10, it's 50 million. We're already past 50 million copies. Like, oh, sorry. You know? <laughs> but I mean, but the point is, how do you go from 20,000 to 50 million just because you changed the title? And, and it started getting me fascinated. I had created this thing I call a passion box where every time I saw something that was emotional selling, I didn't try to overanalyze it because I couldn't understand it, but I'd put it in a passion box, okay? And my wife hated going to doctor's offices with me because every time I'd go there, I'd you know, open up a magazine that I never saw before. And I go, oh, wow, look at this. And she goes, don't tear it out of the magazine. <laughs> like, we're in a doctor's office. And I'm like, no, no, I need this. This is too great. She'd like sit as far away as possible from me so that, uh, you know, I do not know that guy. But after I learned about John Gray's uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and it went from 20,000 to 50 million copies just because of the change, I realized it's a metaphor. I mean, men aren't really from a different planet. But by saying men are from Mars and women are from Venus, it kind of, it makes the point, you know, through an analogy or metaphor. And so I went, is metaphor the answer to social media? I mean, to, to uh, emotional selling? You know, certainly this is your brain on drugs is also a metaphor because your brain is not an egg. I mean, it might be for some, but it's not an egg. And so I dumped the passion box on my bed and I realized there are 14 brain triggers at the heart of emotional selling. And I first realized and I started, uh, you know, tracking it, all these people who changed the name or developed the name of a product or a service and suddenly it exploded and because I've been a consultant and ran a, 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 you know, big consulting company in California, I ran one of California's leading behavior management firms. So we get to experiment with clients, you know, it's really great. Like if you own a business, you get to try your own stuff. But if you're a consultant, you get to experiment with clients. And I went, wow, this is really powerful. I wonder if this will if I can easily apply this to clients. I started applying it to clients, and their sales exploded. And I, you know, I realized like, well, in fact, I was doing it for one. I had a um, um, pet supplement company, and I got to do uh, online advertising for it. And it was the first time I passed a million dollars of sales of income. It's like, wow, you know, I remember I was making so much money as a consultant, but suddenly I was making more money selling these products online. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. I actually started feeling like guilty. Like, did I break the law or do something? Like, it's so weird getting, you know, a check for, I, I remember I, ca I called my wife and I said, hey, American Express just charged our credit card a uh, thousand bucks. She said, well, stop it. I said, no, wait a second. We just made 10, 11, 12, 13,000. Well, I'm going to call you back. I realized we have all this money coming in. It was like, wow. As By the way, my wife, as soon as she heard that we're making this much money, she said, spend more. You know, and wives are fun. But anyway, but it made me realize so I had these three clients. One of the first clients I tried this with, I had three clients who had a, um, a construction company. And after 10 years, they had $2 million of sales. That's not bad, $2 million, you know, after 10 years. In one year, by applying brain glue, and I'll tell you how I did it, I took them to $10 million. They went from $2 million after 10 years, in one year, to $10 million of sales. And then two years later, reached $32 million of sales. And I, we did it by applying brain glue. And I'll tell you how I did it with them. So in 10 years, they had, did construction work for all kinds of different pro, uh, clients and everything else. And I pull out a whiteboard and I said, let's make a shopping list of all the different types of clients you go after. You know, I made a shopping list. It took about an hour because, oh, how about this guy? Okay. And there were three, the three partners. And uh, then I said, okay, so let's play a game. Let's pretend you're only going to focus on one of these clients or types of clients who you want to focus on. And they said, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to turn away business. I got it. Well, we're playing a game. Okay, let's figure it out as a game. Okay. Took a while. And they finally said this one client, there are two insurance companies that they had worked with. And they did fire restoration for insurance companies. You know, I didn't know what it was. I don't know construction, but they explained, yeah, it's like every time they have a client that has a fire, they'll call us. And we've only done three projects, like two for one company and one for another one. But that looks like it would be really a great area for us to focus on. And uh, so I said, okay, so um, fire restoration for insurance companies. Okay, so fire that is the word that they're going to think of if they ever have a client that has a fire. He's, and they told me what, what we do is, you know, we figured out that the first thing you check if there's a fire is, is the frame damage. If the frame of the house is damaged, you got to tear down the whole house and, okay, put up a new frame. But if it isn't, then you 
want to rebuild the parts of the house that were burnt and make sure it's not going to catch fire again, stuff like that. And so I said, okay, so if they have a client that has a fire, then fire is a word is a trigger word for them. Okay. Cause they're going to think fire. So why don't we call you guys the fire extinguisher for insurance companies? We'll get the website firex.com. And they started laughing. They said, okay, well, let's try it. You know? So we went out to, uh, I went with them to two of their clients and with uh, prospects. And one of the prospects, we said, yeah, just think of us as your fire extinguisher. Every time you have a client that has a fire, call us and we'll extinguish it for you, you know, at a reasonable cost and everything else. And we kind of know what to do. Their sales exploded. First clients would laugh. If you get, you know, a buyer, a laugher is a buyer. Okay. Mm. You get your clients to laugh. They started laughing, but they said, oh, that makes sense. You know, every time they had a client that had a fire, who do they think of? Fire extinguisher. Hey, I got to call my fire extinguisher. You know, and sales exploded and went from two to 10 million in sales in one year. In fact, one of the guys was razzing me and said, hey, Bond, it was supposed to be 12 million. I was shut up. <laughs> they had so much money coming in. They bought each other a gift of a, the, uh, the, the highest end uh, BMW. They're Beamer guys, you know, they love it. But I mean, it's just they realize life is easy when you can explain it in a way that triggers something in the brain so they remember it. I mean, I do. Sorry, go ahead. You want to ask something? No, well, you 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 talked about um, in the beginning where it's almost like you feel guilty. And I just wonder, is there any downside to like emotional selling? Like like you said, we, we want to have this, you know, and maybe it's like naive feeling of, well, I have this great product and I'm a great person. People should just want to buy from me. You almost feel not not slimy, but it's like, what do you say to someone that's like uncomfortable saying, well, I want to be emotional or, or you know, kind of drive that that sales through that means you want to be passionate about your product i mean here's one of the things that i recognize okay a lot of people have fabulous products but they do do a terrible job marketing if you have a product you're passionate about that you've done a really good job with then you've got to transfer that passion because guess what the reason you love the product in the first place or developed it is because of emotion you know passion is an emotion i mean i work with a, a paint company a paint manufacturer and I, and when I started working with them, the first thing they said was, yeah, it's kind of boring. It's paint. How, you know, boring is paint. And to me, it's like, you've got to be passionate. And so I started thinking, you know, we had two things. We're Southern California. It's a Southern California company. And it turns out that, uh, what's his name who did Titanic, uh, used our paint on his, on his boats because they worked in, you know, he had, he didn't build a full Titanic, you know, he built, you know, um, but so we were we were the Titanic guys because he used our paint specifically on the Titanic. And they went, oh, that's cool. We didn't think of that. Um, and then, um, you know, I heard about the paint. Like uh, one of the guys they had uh, who developed paint for them invented airplane paint. And he had uh, patents on airplane paint. And I'm like, well, patents on airplane paint? What's that? And he said, well, first paint for, that goes on an airplane can't be too thick because it adds weight to the plane. So it's got to be thin. Oh, okay, that's cool. Second is it goes high up in the sky. So it gets access to the, more access to the sun without being protected. So it, colors tend to fade. This can't fade. You can't have your plane landing and suddenly it's got faded colors. You start thinking, wait a second, what's, you know, I don't know if I want to take a, a flight on that plane. And the third one is because it goes through tremendous um, temperature changes. Sometimes it'll be high, high up there and really hot and it'll land in the snow, you know, and, and when you get stuff like that, often it cracks, it, you know, because it expands, it contracts and everything else. And so it, he invented paint that solved those problems and has the patents on them. And I'm like, that's amazing. And so when these guys started realizing, you know, they, they are a paint and coatings company. And I said, what's coatings? You know, I said, well, paint is a coating. People, it's a colored coating, but it's basically a coating. And I said, oh, cool. Well, why not, how about we sell coatings instead of just paint? And uh, I said, what do you guys love to do? You know, bring out the passion. And they said, well, we love playing guitar. And um, shoot, I forget the name of it, but one of the biggest guitar companies in the world is uh, in uh, Orange County, California. It's just down the street from them, uh, Gibson Guitar. And so they said, uh, well, we love playing guitar. We play guitar at night. We have a band and everything else. Some of the guys said, well, and, and Gibson Guitar is just down the street from us. Why don't we... Get, go down to Gibson Guitar and ask them if we can create coatings for their paint for their guitars. So that would be really fun. But what happened was I was showing them the power of passion. By the way, once they got passionate about it and they love guitars, 
they would go down there and they would say, oh, we love guitars. I've got one of your guitars. And by the way, we're a coatings company and we can give you really cool coatings for your paint. It's like nobody has to teach them how to sell. These guys were passionate. And so there's there were two studies. Uh, um, there's a, a Harvard professor uh, named uh, Gerald Zaltman and uh, Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman. And both of them discovered that more than 90% of buying decisions are emotionally triggered. You know, logic could be a part, but it's the emotion centers of the brain. You have to love stuff. I mean, think of the car you you drive or the house you live in, the city, neighborhood or whatever else, you know, the clothes you wear. You know, you're not going to wear something. I mean, I love, I've got the sweater. I love it. And it's got a, to- a hole in the, in the elbow. My wife is like, you know, but, but we got it. We went to Hawaii with our daughter and we had fun. And it just reminds me that it's really cool. Big deal as a whole. She says, do you have to wear that? You know, I was like, yes, I do. I love this sweater. You know, but it's just we're passionate and passion drives us. I saw this guy who had a T-shirt that says life sucks and then you die. And I'm like, no, although I do know two people that can really use that (laughs) T-shirt. But I just know, you know, we're driven by passion. I mean, life is short. You know, as uh, Mel Gibson said in uh, what was it called? Where, you know, freedom. Bravery. uh, Yeah. Yeah. It was just I mean, he he was talking about if all of us live. You know, all of us die, but not everybody truly lives. You want to live your life in passion. If you're passionate about your product, you know, we're logical people. So we get a product that we developed that we're passionate about, and then we try to use logic to sell it. Well, if you can't use a, a brain trigger, you're hurting yourself. And I'll give you a funky, they're funky areas. You know, um, what does um, Richard Branson and olive oil have in common? <laughs> virgin virgin olive oil and virgin airlines actually he started with virgin uh records okay i mean he recognized the power of a a trigger word virgin okay and so i i I love trigger words as one of 14 brain triggers but uh dirty dirty is a really great word okay i mean think about this have from because it wakes up the brain there are certain things that wake up the brain I'm telling you, people change in the title of their product, the name of their product, or how they pitch it, and suddenly sales explode. I get like people are, you know, they they're blown away by this. My book shows you that, you know. But dirty, you have dirty dancing. What is dirty dancing? Are they naked? Are they, I mean, what is dirty dancing? But the name dirty dancing gets your attention. Dirty Harry, okay. I mean, Clint Eastwood was awesome in the Dirty Harry movies, but I mean. Is he dirty? Does he break the law or what? You know, but Dirty Harry is really powerful. I had this, um, and then when I grew up, uh, they had uh, The Dirty Dozen, which is a hot movie, okay? Uh, They have uh, Dirty uh, Rotten Scoundrels, uh, which is a Steve Martin movie, you know? And so dirty is a powerful word. So I was trying to get my book covered by major magazines. So I sent them uh, an email that says, The Dirty Truth About One of Your Articles. And they responded, you know, <laughs> wait a second. You know, I mean, I, I said it, it dirty is I'm using a trigger word dirty to get your attention because I think my book will be interesting for your audience. And so they responded right, by, right away. But he said, whoa, you got our attention. You know, <laughs> you know, the dirty truth. I mean, if they said the truth about your article, you know, one of your articles, that wouldn't have the same power as the dirty truth about one of your articles. And so when we recognize, I mean, we take a look at companies that are just massively successful. I'll give you a few examples. Um, so um, Terry Smith started a company, a manufacturing company. And he made some money. So he ended up buying another company, a friend's company that made fans, really big fans. And they were used um, in um, farms and in, uh, you know, in a barn, like for a cow, in a cow barn, you're not going to put, or even a horse barn, you're not going to put air conditioning. But see, they put a big fan and he had really, really big fans that he made. And so, you know, okay, he was selling big fans, whatever the name of the company was. And then he got this idea. He came up with an ad and he said, these are big ass fans. And sales exploded. And he went, whoa, just because I used the word ass, big ass fans, suddenly people are buying the product and they weren't really buying it before. And uh, he he got the idea. He said, maybe I should change the name of the company to big ass fans. He has a really cool logo of a, a donkey's butt facing you. He's he's and his face is away from you, but turned looking at you, you know, big ass fans. He was having fun with the name, but it sold like crazy so much so that in 15 years, he, he was able to sell the company for five hundred million 
dollars. And in fact, what happened was along the way when he he started calling a company big ass fans and he put the logo big ass fans and all his products, he started offering other products for a while. And he said, wait a second, it's taking me away from just focusing on fans. He got rid of the other products and just focused on fans and built this monster of a company. And it's just, there's so many that are like that. I, I saw I saw this show on the Discovery Channel, which is fantastic. And this is like, think about this for a second. Would it be annoying if you invented a really amazing product and one of your competitors copied the product and came up with a name that was so hot that you would never be able to sell the product, but they sold a gazillion of them? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it piss you off if your competitor knocked you out of the industry that you invented or the business? Welcome to Pop-Tarts, okay? Uh, Post Cereals competes with Kellogg's and Post came up and they wanted to come up with a totally different type of, of snack for everybody, okay? You can use it for breakfast and all that stuff. So they came up with the idea of a little cake with uh, jelly inside it that you could put in a toaster. And they called it Country Squares. Country Squares, okay? And so Kellogg's competes with Post, you know, like, you know, like fire. And uh, about two months before they uh, uh, post launch Country Squares, they were advertising and bragging to the media, hey, we have this product coming out. It's really cool. You put it in a toaster. It's got jelly in it and stuff. It's, it's got, uh, you know, it's like a little cake. And they thought, what a great idea. So within two months, he found some, some guys. They created a product, that product. They copied that product. And he wanted to come up with a name. And so back then, uh, Andy Warhol was really famous, the artist Andy Warhol, and he was a pop artist. And so everybody knew the word pop art. So he came up with the term pop art. Let's use that, but let's call it pop tart. Also, because it's sound, it's the pop out of the toaster, pops out of the toaster. Pop tart sold like crazy. In fact, so it sold so much that they had to run an ad apologizing, saying, we know you love Pop-Tarts. We're so sorry we ran out of stock, but we'll be coming up in about a week or two with the product will be available again. So people didn't buy country squares. So they were practically starving to death. They waited for Pop-Tarts to come available, even though both were basically the same product and it was invented by, by uh, Post. You know, it's like, they must have pissed them off. Can you imagine? I invented this cool product. He has a better name than me and suddenly he's making a fortune. But I mean, you start to recognize, that's why people who read my book recognize this, you know, it's blowing them away. It's totally different from other books that they've seen. You know, some chapters have just like three pages. It explains one of the brain triggers. It gives you examples and it shows you how to create it for yourself. And then you move on. And it just blows people's minds. I have Jack Hanfield who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. He sold 500 million books, 500 million. I mean, how many Americans are there? I mean, people in America, they sold five, 400 million. He sold 100 million chicken soup for the soul and 400 million of the other chicken soup, chicken soup for the teenage soul, chicken soup for the cancer survivor soul and stuff like that. 500 million books. He got pissed at me. He said, uh, you know, I started reading a book. I was just glancing at it and I couldn't put the damn thing down. And I'm forcing everybody in my company to read and to you apply this stuff. But here's the thing about me, because I'm a logical person. The title was not brain glue. The title was, uh, it was a left brain logical title, not an emotional title. It was sell more with the right brain marketing strategy. And he said, he started telling me, oh, I love this book. I can't believe it. I can't put the damn thing down. It's amazing. I said, oh, wow. You know, first I apologize. I'm sorry. It's, you know, the, you're whole, hooked on the book. But I said, can I use that as a quote? He said, you can use all these things I'm saying as a quote on one condition. You got to change the title. You're torturing us by making us use emotional selling in our in our uh, you know product names and product descriptions, and you got a logical name for your title. It, the whole book is about brain glue. It's brain glue. You got to change the title, and I will let you. I'll let you use my testimonials. And so it's really great. But I mean, it's just it's easy for us because we're lo you know if you create products or services, you're usually you're a technical person. You're trying to make it so it works well and everything else. But we get passionate about what we do. But when we define it or name it, we call it a logical name. And we have to call it an emotional name or we're going to lose sales. You know, I mean, Squatty Potty is a good example. You know, it's a, a mom and her son in uh, Utah. And she's sitting on a toilet and she says, you know, it's better for the body if you raise your feet about six inches, you know, the shape of your body and blah, 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 you know, all that stuff. 
And so we should create a little stool that goes there in, in that people use when they go to the bathroom. Okay, and they have no business experience, okay? But they were thinking about it and they said, okay, well, you know, well, we don't want to call it the toilet stool. My wife says they should have called it the stool stool, but I don't think that would work. <laughs> okay, not work. Enough. But uh, uh, they're thinking about it. They're saying, well, we don't want to call it the toilet stool, the toilet. So another word for toilet is potty. So we'll call it the potty. And then what do you do? You know, after squat. So why don't we call it the squatty potty? They reached 100 million of sales. They had no business experience, okay? They reached 100 million of sales in less than two years. They actually eventually got a shark tank and all the, the sharks were standing in line to work with them because the name Squatty Potty so resonates. It's like, oh, what a cool name. $100 million for a simple freaking stool that goes, you know, in the bathroom. You know, they have this guy, um, um, Paul Tran. And he invented an electric razor that used for man's private areas. I don't know why I'm getting all these private areas thing and poop and stuff anyway. But just to think about this. So he created an electric razor for man's private areas. And he was trying to think of a name. It's one of the things we do as analogy or metaphor, which is really a powerful brain go tool that I get people doing. And it's, it blows their minds. Well, his, he started thinking of an analogy or metaphor. And he said, it's almost like a lawnmower. And he started laughing. He said, well, what would happen if I called this the lawnmower? <laughs> he did, okay? He started talking to his friends and they laughed. He said, yeah, that's crazy. But what are you going to really call it? He said, I don't know. The lawnmower. Maybe I should call it the lawnmower. He eventually called his company a manscaped. I'm landscaping men with a lawnmower, okay? His sales exploded, exploded, you know? I mean, it's just, I was thinking, you know, if I don't, I don't own one, but if I had one, I wouldn't let guys share it, okay? Right. I want to do that. But I'd share the story. I'd say, hey, guess what I just got? The lawnmower. He said, what, you have to mow your lawn? No, no, no. It's for man mowing your, your own lawn. Your I want to clarify. Do you think that, you know, we all have heard in marketing that it's important to be, you know, tell a story about what it is we're doing. Do you think that these triggers are, are part of that storytelling? Because it made me think whenever you said that, you know, like metaphors are a powerful one. And it's like, well parables like in the bible were metaphors and that's why they were so memorable is it just about being memorable is it about that trigger or is this a factor of storytelling as a whole both okay both i mean we remember stories more but there are certain it isn't always stories but we remember stories and part of why we want to do storytelling and why it's so powerful in marketing you know is to think of apple computer i mean we know the story of steve jobs and what he went through and he got thrown out and he came back i mean we knew the stories early on and stuff like that i mean storytelling is really powerful because we want to you know we're not talking about an object okay what we're talking about is an object that we can emotionally relate to i'll go back to the paint guys okay they weren't just selling paint the whole hum they were selling cool paint you know this is really cool and so uh you know that's why story we do storytelling and it's very important but I learned and discovered that, I mean, metaphor is a storytelling, okay? So Jack Canfield was telling me how, so he wrote a book, 101 Emotional Stories That Will Change Your Life, okay? Really fabulous stories. The book is awesome. But he didn't want to call it 101 Emotional uh, Motivating Stories because that was like, you know, other people have books, the same title and everything else. It just wasn't working for him. And so he said it was about a month or so. And he woke up one day and he said, ah, oh, you know, um, chicken soup makes you feel good when you feel bad. My book makes you feel good when you feel bad. Why don't I call it chicken soup for the spirit? Okay. But then he said, it doesn't seem to work exactly. It doesn't seem to work exactly. But so after a little while, he was thinking S-O-U-P, S-O-U-L. It's alliteration, repetition of sounds. Chicken soup, soul. Chicken soup for the soul sounds better and resonates better than chicken soup for the spirit. I got to call it chicken soup for the soul. And the rest, as I say, is history. Okay. Alliteration, by the way, is a really powerful tool. These are tools that we see and we don't recognize. Once I start showing to people, they go, oh, I didn't realize it. Think of this. All the companies that use alliteration in their name, which is a repetition of sounds, Coca-Cola, Best Buy, PayPal, TikTok, for all you ladies out there, Lululemon, okay? It's a repetition of sound. And when we hear a repetition of sound, it resonates and sticks to the brain. That's why it's called brain glue, by the way, because these stick to, stick to the brain. And here's how, here's how um, brain glue works, okay? This is the conceptual uh, metaphor, a story, okay? You like storytelling? Here's the storytelling. So you leave your home and you're driving down the street and you're passing by all these homes or apartments, okay? 
you're not going to look at every single one of them every day. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. No, you just drive past them every day. You've seen them already. You know who's there and what's that, whatever else is happening. And every day you just drive past the homes. One day you're driving down the street and one of your neighbors out of their window is coming flames. You're going to stop and go, huh? <gasps> Does he know his house is on fire? It's not going to catch house fire. My it wakes you up. It's a trigger. It's a brain trigger that's wired into us. That's what brain glue is, is you want to have, I call it, you want to light the fire of desire in your buyer. Okay. You, because when we look at products, what do we look at? Oh, product, 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 product. Okay. Product, product, product. Okay. Big deal. Okay. Uh, and we tend to not notice it, but you want to light, you want to have flames coming out of your window of your product. Okay. You want to have them go, huh? What's that? Huh? You know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Huh? That's, huh? That's weird. Pick it up. Look at it. Okay. You know, squatty potty. Huh? That's interesting. What's that? That's, what's that all about? Okay. And the lawnmower, you know, I mean, you want to stand out because if you don't stand, we're so bombarded and overwhelmed with, you know, with knowledge and information and our phones, we're on our, our texting all the time and we're and all that stuff that we're bombarded, that we're basically not aware of what's really happening. And so if you have a product that's awesome, you need to find a way to light the fire on your window. So they're driving down the street, product, 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 fact, 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 fact. It doesn't just work with products. It works with facts and things that you say. Uh, President John F. Kennedy used something called chiasmus. And let me give you some examples of chiasmus. Chi a rhyme is really powerful. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Johnny Cochran uses it to get O.J. Simpson off from an almost certain guilty verdict in a murder trial. Okay, rhyme is really powerful. Um, I heard so, um, but so let me give you chiasmus. Chi so rhyme is A, B, A, B. Chiasmus is A, B, B, A. And I'll tell you, now that I said it, I'll tell you how it works. Winners never quit and quitters never win. Okay, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Okay, so you can't, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. My wife hates that song. Okay, it's a famous song. But uh, it's it's a flip, okay? And so, uh, in fact, I want to give you some because these are really hilarious. Um, Mae West, in the early days of the movie industry, had tons of them. She said, it's better to be looked over than overlooked, okay? Uh, women like a man with a past, but they prefer a man with a present, hmm. okay? Show up for the present, okay? Uh, when women go wrong, men go right after them. Good girls go to heaven. Bad girls go everywhere. She had another one. I don't know if I should say this. I'll say this anyway. A hard man is good to find. <laughs> it's a woman's line. Okay, what can I say? But it's so the flips, okay? I have a, a joke because a lot of comedians use it. I, this is for old people out there, okay? You're young, uh, Jordan. So <laughs> I'd rather wake up and pee than pee and wake up, <laughs> okay? But they work, okay? Uh, so let's say you're starting a hamburger place and you're competing with McDonald's, Burger King, uh, Wendy's, and all that stuff, okay? They spent tens of millions of dollars advertising. So how are you going to compete with them? You know, they're going to go to McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's and all that stuff. They're not going to go to your place unless you come up with a name that has a trigger, brain trigger. Why don't we call it In-N-Out Burgers? On the, East Coast, on the West Coast, we have In-N-Out Burgers. In-N-Out Burgers has a massive line of cars always. You know, I was, we were driving past it, my wife and I, just the other day, one of the In-N-Out Burgers near us. And it's just like, look, there's a massive line still got to stand in line sit in line with your car but in and out burgers first it was uh you know pick up and take out so it worked that way but in and out is a uh, opposite so it uses chiasmus but it also um it in and out used to refer it still does to sex <laughs> so you're driving down the street in and out in and out burger what <laughs> it stops you <laughs> there's flames okay <laughs> in and out <laughs> what's that all about oh well it looks cool let's check it out okay and it just, because they recognize they're a small business, it's a family owned business that doesn't have the money that a McDonald's or Burger King has. So they have to use brain glue triggers. And when you use a brain glue trigger, you stand out from the crowd and it makes it easier. So it's, it applies, a lot of famous people use it. Uh, President John F. Kennedy used it. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. He said, mankind must put an end to war or war will put an end to mankind. Malcolm X, who was fabulous, who was a civil rights activist, in the early days, uh, he had great lines. He said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock landed on us. Okay. I mean, think of how much more powerful. You have one guy that says, man, you have no idea how hard it is being a black person in America. And the other guy says, 
you know, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, the rock landed on us. Which one are you going to start repeating to everybody else? You know, it resonates. He also, Malcolm X also said, and a lot of people don't know he said this, when you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. He recognized the power of triggering brain triggers, okay? You know, instead of just saying, hey, look, you know, guys, you got, you know, what do you stand for? You know, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. It's like, it resonates, doesn't it? it of course. And is the idea that you would use this for like marketing campaigns as well? Like it's not, it goes beyond just the name of a business or, or the name of something. Now I was reading an article the other day that talked about um, like at Bed Bath & Beyond, they put the comforters and things like that that are soft on a hard floor because of the juxtaposition. Like if you put it on carpet, it doesn't seem quite as soft. So it's like exactly. people use it for a product placement. We use it for, you know, maybe a TV ad is, is the idea that we'd use these brain triggers and that throughout all of our marketing uh, efforts, or is it just like the title of our business? Both. Absolutely. Okay. You're absolutely right. Use it for marketing. And so um, <laughs> competitors of Wonder Bread invented sliced bread. You know, when people say, wow, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. They're actually referring to Wonder Bread. Yeah, but Wonder Bread would bleach their bread and develop right and invent white sliced bread. And for 10 years, they dominated the bread industry and their competitors hated them. <laughs> their competitors came up with a rhyming phrase Okay. And it almost threw Wonder Bread into bankruptcy. They went from way up here and massively dominating the industry to almost out of business with one phrase. You want to hear what the phrase was? Yeah. The whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. Wow. <laughs> and they repeated it. They said it to like journalists and journalists wrote it in magazines and every, it resonated so much that everybody else started, every journalist would start including, hey, guess what? The whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. Now they, back then, they had a, an illness called pellagra, which we have, you know, we had uh, COVID. So they had pellagra, but people were dying out of the blue. And part of why the people were dying was because they lack, when you lack vitamin B3, it, it somehow affects the body and you die. Today, they put niacin in it, which has lots of B3. And so the way Wonder Bread almost went out of business because everybody almost started to stop eating Wonder Bread. What are your bread? The quicker you're dead. Oh, I'm not going to eat that anymore. Okay. And so what they did was they invented fortified food. They started putting niacin and other things in it. They actually invented it because if they wouldn't have invented it, nobody would have bought the product. And now they said, well, it has vitamins and minerals in it and everything else. But the, a phrase was so powerful that they were able to in, introduce this phrase and it stopped people from buying. And you're absolutely right. So let me give you another, uh, another brain glue trick because they're different tricks, okay? I mean, they're tools, okay? So Marilyn Monroe, a lot of people don't know this about Marilyn Monroe. Okay, and I'm going to explain how this works. So Marilyn Monroe, first her name was Norma Jean. Norma Jean, I forget what her last name was, but it was, but she would go by Norma Jean. And her business manager said, Marilyn is a better name than Norma Jean. She goes, okay, so I changed her name to Marilyn. And her stepfather, I'm pretty sure it was her stepfather, was named Monroe. So she went Marilyn Monroe, which is, you know, Marilyn Monroe. It's alliteration, repetition of sound. So that works. Uh, she loved this lady um, um, named, um, um, I can't remember her name, but she was world famous, um, uh, a world famous actress, and she had platinum blonde hair. And so Marilyn went to the same uh, hairdresser to get her hair dyed platinum blonde. So she was platinum blonde, just like, uh, you know, this famous actress. So that was fine. But she has a beauty mark on the left, on her left cheek, and she would cover it up with makeup. But one day she's looking at her at this famous actress, and she notices that in a, um, Jean Harlow, and she's looking at photographs of Jean Harlow, and she sees in some photographs, she has a, a beauty mark on her cheek, and some of it, she has it on her chin. Wait a second. I bet she doesn't even have a beauty mark. I bet she's putting a dot on her face to bring attention to her face. And so that from that point forward, Marilyn, instead of hiding her beauty mark, she, she darkened the beauty mark. And she believed that that became massively successful. Cindy Crawford is another is a is a supermodel, and uh, she became massively famous because she had a beauty mark uh, over her left uh, uh, um, lip. And when she was she would talk about how when she was young she begged her mom to take me to the doctor and have this removed, and her mom didn't. And she said, "I'm so glad my mom didn't have it removed, because I believe my beauty mark is a huge reason why I became a supermodel." OK, so what made me think of the, the beauty marks and looking at those things is that's alliteration. There's, you know, we like balance and, and like where faces look the same. My wife, it drives her nuts. If you have a guy who's got a lazy eye, 
you know, so one side of his face, if you cover it, it looks one way and the other way, you cover half the other half, it looks another way. She said, look at that guy's face is driving me nuts because she needs symmetry, but asymmetry grabs your attention, which is why the dot on the face works. I mean, think of, uh, what's his name? The boxer <laughs> um, that uh, bit the guy's ear off. Um, oh, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson and half his face is uh, tattooed, you know, I mean, yeah. he's fantastic. But what made me think of it was there's a famous um, there's a famous um, uh, advertiser um, name. I'm losing my name, so I'm losing my my mind. You know what can I say? Uh, but the famous advertiser, I'll think of his name in a second. Um, and uh, he was doing an ad for um, Hathaway shirts. And to show you how successful he became, um, Brookshire Hathaway is owned by Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett bought Hathaway shirts because they make so much money. And so this guy, the advertiser, he realized if you're doing an ad, a full page ad for Hathaway shirts, a shirt ad. Okay, what do you have? You have a good looking guy with a shirt, a nice pair of pants in a nice background. Okay. Oh, hum, it looks like every other shirt ad. He came up with this idea, David Ogilvy. David Ogilvy came up with this idea. Why don't I put an eye patch on the guy? No reason. And I'll call it the man with the Hathaway shirt. Okay. <laughs> And then people will read it like, well, how come he has an eye patch on? Okay, it never explains it. He has different guys with eye patches. But because he put an eye patch on the guy, it grabs attention. You're going through, flipping through magazine, magazine. Oh, here's a guy with an eye patch. Oh, that's odd. And it grabs your attention. So instead of all the other ads where it just shows off the shirt, you have a guy with an eye patch and you go, the man with a Hathaway shirt. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's his shirt. Okay. And it grabs your attention. And it helps us to understand that if we we want to stand out from the crowd, and there are certain tools that will help us stand out from the crowd so it grabs our attention, like you're going down the street and flames are coming out of the window. You know, it isn't quite flames, but it's an eye patch. It's just like flames. It isn't a, a flames, but it's a dot on uh, Marilyn Monroe's face. You know, it's a real dot, but it's on her face. You know, but when people understand that you want to stand out from the crowd, I can have the greatest product in the world, but if nobody even notices it, I'm going to starve to death. That's not fair. You know, or, or my competitor who will come up with the name Pop-Tarts and throw me out of the industry because he's selling more than I am just because he came up with a good name, even though I invented the damn product. And that's why it's so important that you've, you know, people go through my book and they're going like, oh, wow. You know, they usually go through it twice. Okay. And the first time they go through it, because you're going through it, is it any good? And the second time is I'm, I'm going through it a second time because I got to, you know, because I got to do this with my thing. I got to have alliteration in my name or how I describe the product. Or I've got to have a, a rhyme. I mean, think about this. I'll go back to it. Johnny Cochran, he got O.J. Simpson freed from an almost certain guilty verdict. I remember after the trial, they asked two of the jurors, um, you know, with all that evidence against O.J., why do you find him not guilty? And one of them was saying it while the other one was nodding her head in agreement. And she said, hey, look, we knew if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. The glove didn't fit. We had to acquit. I mean, they're repeating the rhyme because it sticks in the brain. And so here, here um jack and joe went up the hill okay and i bet everybody who's listening entered and knew that one. yeah for most of us if we've ever heard that before we heard it when we were kids 10 20 for me maybe 50 years ago or more and yet it sticks to the brain i can be in my deathbed they say hey james jack and joe went up the hill to fetch a pail of water jack you know we remember it because it sticks to the brain and so what you want is you want your product or service like like fire extinguisher, you want it to stick to the brain. So when it's time to buy, they go, oh wait, fire. We have this guy has a fire. Oh, I gotta call a fire extinguisher. You want it to stick to the brain in such a way that they remember your product. You know, isn't it terrible when you have this product that's really fantastic, and then later on you need the product and you can't remember what the freaking name is. It drives you nuts. What's the name of it? I, I remember that thing, da, 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 da. Squatty Potty. Oh, yeah, that's what it is, you know? I mean, so that's why you you want to stand out from the crowd. You want to be there in their brain when first, if they're ready to buy now, that they'll buy yours because yours stands out from everything else. And if they're not ready to buy right now, when they're ready to buy, you want them to remember your, your name. Do you think that people don't use these tools just because they don't know about them or, or two, do we get stuck in our ego and say, well, I don't want to change the name away from whatever I came up with or naming it after myself. Do you, do you think it's a combination of those things? Or is it just simply we're not aware of it because it's so subtle and almost to our subconscious that we don't even think of it. It's both. And it's both in this way. Okay. I mean, a lot of people won't. So I have this uh, product that I work with and the owner of the company of a martial arts equipment company. It was a fabulous, we were talking about, 
the biggest problem that people in martial arts have is carrying all their stuff. Okay. Backpacks never hold all the stuff you have because you got, you know, there's so much gear. And so because of that, they're always carrying two or three bags. And so they came up with this idea of creating a monster, a huge backpack. And so what did he call it? He called it the, um, the, um, uh, the locker, the, um, I have to remember the name of this thing. I'm losing my mind. Um, uh, but he called it travel locker. Okay. But th I, I changed the name for him. Okay. But he was torn because we always put in small letters, the travel locker. He, he, we didn't get totally rid of the name, but we did. But I said, why, you know, what did we solve when we've created the product? Cause he called it a travel locker. Cause it's got all these pockets and pouches and it's got hidden pockets in it. It was really cool. But the main reason why we created it, why he created it was because he needed something, people need something big enough to carry. And so when you call it the travel locker, that doesn't help people understand what it is. It's like, what's a travel locker, okay? You're carrying a locker around with you? And so I looked at it and I said, let's first I said, let's call it the monster because it's a monster. I said, nah, so I got a better word, the beast, a backpack so big that it holds all your gear. And he said, well, okay. And he's torn by what you're saying about ego. But I like the name Travel Locker. I said, let's go around to all the employees. And he had all these salespeople and stuff. I said, so guys, here's the choice. Here's the, here's the product, okay? Should we call it the Travel Locker? And everyone kind of, or the Beast. Huh, the Beast, for sure. They would not even hesitation. We got to call it the Beast. The backpack's so big that it carries all your gear. And so now sales exploded like this when we changed the name. But he was still tortured. So we always put in small print, the Travel Locker, okay? <laughs> and it's because he didn't want to give it up. But it, and it, it, it's ego is part of it. But, you know, money is better than ego. Sorry, guys. You know, and I went with him like we're going like, you know, we want to make as much money as possible. So like, why don't we run a split test ad? We'll do the travel locker and some ads and the beast and other ads. And then just the sales were like there was such a difference. And, you know, you had to accept it. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I know it's hard. It was hard for me. My book was called Sell More with the Right Brain Marketing Strategy and Jack Canfield forced me to change it. It's about brain glue, call it brain glue. I said, oh, but people won't really know what it is. And you'll explain it to them, brain glue. People didn't know what, you know, chicken soup for the soul was. And as we described it, people went, oh, wow. And suddenly it stuck to them and they bought it like crazy. Your book, you're the brain glue guy. You have to call it brain glue. And yeah, it was torture for me because I'll have to change it. And with books, you know, you know, I was almost at a hundred reviews and after you pass a hundred reviews or so on Amazon, it, they help you and they promote the book a lot more. And to me, it's like, I'm getting there and I got to go back to zero because if I change a name, a title of the book, then I don't get all those, uh, you know, reviews. I have to get reviews again, but he was right. You know I mean? It's just, and people were tortured because they said, we could never remember the name of your product. You know, sell more with right brain marketing. Well, I can never remember. I said, this book is awesome, but I can't remember the name of it. So they would, I have a problem because my name's James Bond. So you look up James Bond, what are you getting? You're not getting me, you're getting right. Sean Connery, you know? You know, you know, oh, seven. And so too bad I'm not one of those. Oh, awesome. <laughs> anyway, but, but, you know, it just, Brain Glue made it easy. And Brain Glue is what the book is about. And it also, it helps people understand passion. It's like, it makes your ideas sticky. It makes your ideas sticky. So they stick to the brain like glue. <laughs> That's why for all, you know, for all you guys and gals out there, you know, you have a product that you love. You've worked hard to do this. Wouldn't it be awesome if suddenly it could sell so fast you could barely have enough inventory? You know, like, uh, you know, like uh, Pop-Tarts. They actually had to put an ad, uh, an apology ad. <laughs> Sorry, we ran out of product, guys. You you bought like 10 times more than we thought you were going to buy. But it's it's amazing. You know, people do this and they start experimenting with their own products and services. I have this lady that sells candles. And I forget the name of her candle company, but we're changing the name of the candle to the Better Life Candle Company. You know, and she goes like, yeah, you know, she's got candles that, you know, make you feel good and may then boost your brain power and all that stuff. And so instead of telling what the ingredients are, now we've got her. So she's actually telling what the candle does, you know, and it's just amazing. She, people are looking at going, that's really cool. Oh, wow. I never thought of a candle actually keeps you awake during the day and makes you uh, able to figure things out and boost your attention span. Wow. That's real. I didn't know candles do that, but you know, it's, it's, Yes, you have to, you have to look at, you know, you want people to be passionate enough about your product that they're going to buy it because as those two studies found or others, but there are two major studies, more than 90% of buying decisions are emotionally triggered. 
Yeah, it's 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 crazy. I I want to um, in closing, I guess, what's the outside of like searching the book? What's the best way for people to follow you and and see what you have going on? And what is next for you? Is it more books? Is it is it you know just pursuing this the brain glue thing? What's next for you? Well, I'm focusing on brain glue first. I mean, Jack Hanfield told me he thinks that it should be uh, every single business school should have it. And so we've got uh, three major business schools. I won't say which ones, but one of them has three letters. <laughs> one of the top schools in the country, but um, that they're actually uh, considering having this as a standard part of the program, their marketing program, because they recognize anyone who's in business needs to be doing this. Uh, so I'm, I'm right now I'm in the process of creating a video training program for each one of the 14 triggers, although you don't need them because the book is really good. I think, I mean, I'm not saying that, but you know, it's got, you know, look at the reviews on Amazon. I mean, it's just that people are, it's blowing people away because unlike a lot of books where you have to read through it and read through all the pages. I mean, I have short attention span. So I created a book for people to have short attention span. So instead of reading 40 pages to finally get one point, you read three pages and go, oh, wow. Oh, that's interesting. And then you get another issue, you know, another tool. And as you go through the tools, it beca- it's, and it's only like, a, I think it's 177 pages or something. It's like, it's, it's short and sweet. And so people are, you know, and it's fun. I've got jokes in there because humor works. So I've got jokes in there. By the way, on the second page, I told the story of uh, my four-year-old daughter didn't want to have sex with the boy next door. And people think like, what? But as you read it, it's actually mind, mind blowing. I think it is, but a lot of people do because it makes a point that people don't consider. But yeah, just an easy way to do it would be um, if you go to braingluepage.com, braingluepage.com, it takes you to a page that shows you all the stuff. That's Jack Hanfield uh, video. He's actually talking about it. He starts by saying, I love this book. You know, we all want somebody like famous to say that, but he starts explaining why. But it just, it, it gives you an overview of what's in the book. And if, you know, hopefully you'll buy it, but even if you don't buy it, go to Amazon and ch- check out the book. And look at the table of contents and you'll see some of the things inside there. You know, Amazon lets you look at some free stuff too. But it's just, this is about changing your life. Life is short. And we want to have, you know, if I create something that I'm passionate about, I want other people to be passionate about it too. And the first thing you have to do is like you're driving down the street and you want to make flames come out of your window. Emotional flames. You want people to look at it and go, oh, wow. No, oh, that's interesting. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. What's that all about? Then they pick up the book. Guess what? The, the path to buying it is getting them to pick it up first. If you're selling a product in a store, if you're selling a product online, it's the same thing. You know, you the first thing you want them to do is to not flip past it, but go like, huh, squatty potty? What's that all about? Huh, okay. You know, and then your product is the same. I mean, you know, we have squatty potty as one. We also have a porta potty. You know, I mean, this works in industrial businesses. It's amazing. There's a, I mean, there are just, there, there's so many levels and layers to this. I saw this thing which uh, this guy was telling me um, um, JB Weld is better than Gorilla Glue as far as glue is, industrial glue is concerned to stick things, you know, sticks anything to anything. And JB Weld is better than Gorilla Glue. But which of those two do you think is more successful? (laughs) Go to uh, Home Depot and Gorilla Glue has practically a whole section and there's JB Weld has a few uh, slots. Why? Because of Gorilla Glue. What a name. I mean, do we remember it? And so if you have a product or service that you're offering, you want people to go, whoa, and you want them to share it, remember it and share it with friends. We want them to buy it. And it's just, you know, this shows you how to do that. And that's what people are blown away by this because it's not just a book to read. It's not a book to read. If you're just going to read it, that's one thing. But it's really to apply it where you start looking at it and going, oh, wow, I can do this. I don't want to change the name of my product. So I'm going to change the description and I'm going to put da, da, da inside it. And then you, you experiment and you suddenly see, you know, sales take off. And that's why it's fun. But anyway, Brain Glue page is a good place to start because it'll take you to a page that shows you a lot of details about what's in the book. No, I can't. I, we'll put a link to to that and to uh, all your socials and stuff at the show. But I can't thank you enough. This was like very insightful. You gave out a lot of information and I, I just appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. And Jordan, and I think I blabbed too much. Sorry about that's that. Okay. I'm pa- See, I'm passionate about it. Yeah. That's what we want. Everybody, you know, you're passionate about your product or service. Hey, thank you, Jordan.